All right, right, everybody, welcome back to College Knowledge. I'm Dave Kozak alongside Joe Kearns. I uh, wanted to talk today about um, some of the noise that's out there. Uh, the college, and, and really what I would call this is kind of post-pandemic mm. higher education, which uh, if you're in it now, you know that it's it's gone kind of haywire. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different, uh, number one, distractions. Uh, everybody's talking about it, writing about it. You bring college loans into it. It causes more issues than people can imagine. Uh, and it really has caused a cloud of just uncertainty sure. in higher education. So one of the biggest issues that I see for kind of the everyday college um, or, or, or uh, budding college student, right, is what's real, what's not real? How mm-hmm. does this whole thing play out? And unfortunately, it's not as clear as it used to be, right? It's not cut and right. dry anymore. There's a, so, so last night I was, I was kind of trying to figure out what I want to talk about today, and I, and I, I did some Google action, mm-hmm. and I went down the rabbit holes of, is college really harder to get into? Mm-hmm. What's the admission rate? Are students actually prepared for college? Is it worth the investment, right? So just straight Google searches on that stuff. Mm-hmm. And what I could not believe was the amount of articles contradicting one another on the subject matter of each of those. Hmm. It's crazy, right? So there were there were some some different kind of looks at it, different angles, um, but the fact is college enrollments are down, right? That is a hundred percent a fact. They were on a steady decline. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, yeah. right? And then the pandemic and the way they dealt with it just kind of crushed yeah. the overall uh, enrollments. And so, you know, I was, I was on US News and World Report checking out some of the stuff they were writing and the statistics are kind of staggering. It was, it was a steady decline, mm-hmm. like consistent decline. Uh, leading up to that. But the undergraduate student body has dropped by nearly 1.4 million students during the pandemic. And this is this is the 2021 statistics. So you're talking about a 10%, almost yeah. nearly a 10% decline. And the expectation was that it was going to tick back up, mm-hmm. right? And it has not. And the the problem that we're seeing now is it's a continuous downturn, and it's not just the four-year schools. Mm-hmm. It's the community college. It's everybody. Okay. The counterintuitive component that shocked me that I think we should talk about is that it's starting to get harder to get into these schools. So explain that, right? Overall, and because I got a whole subset of articles that yeah. are about how it's harder to get into school now. Right. right? So we have less people going. Right. But it's harder to get in. So, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind there is, is this, I mean, obviously it's a big number across the board. Yep. But what schools, you know, you talk about like an Ivy League level school, are they hurting for enrollments? Are they hurting with their applications? No, they're, they're at their lowest admittance rate in history. So... Yeah, but so that's, I guess that's was like some of these numbers that you're saying. Yep. Again, statistics are statistics, but I know the numbers don't lie, but also when you start to dig into some of these, mm-hmm. all right, less people are enrolling in college, but is it less people are enrolling at specific colleges? Well, that's, that's what I'm curious about. And, and so I, I got you, the, I'm sure you don't, you might not have the answer. I got the raw asking, statistics, but. but then I continued to dig into it and there's this this uh an article and I'll, I'll find it in a second but it talks about college enrollment is down but applications at elite schools are at like an all-time high okay right so and and what what the inference was in this or the the assumption in this was that people are now taking this approach that it's like top tier schools or not mm. so you're either getting into harvard or yale or princeton or whatever mm-hmm. or you're not going and that is to me insane. Yeah. I because it's been well documented and proven that that the Harvard degrees and the things that they're not what they used to be 
from a job placement standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, another article here talks about someone, uh, one of the jokes in Ivy is they already get smart students. Their job is not to mess them up, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a, whether it's a stereotype, it, it is, it is a uh, well documented mm -hmm. thought in mm -hmm. the Ivy League world. You're getting the best of the best. Your job's not to mess them up, right? <laughs> First, first thing I got, yeah. got it because that is that's absolutely crazy to me when when you when you say that because my God as an adult now right not for nothing once you hit thirty at least I'll say thirty yep uh, when you say somebody went to an Ivy League institution mm -hmm. it's usually only if uh, you're talking about it in that how not successful that person is right. When maybe like you graduate like 24, 25, people still talk about it and have this aura about, oh my God, you went to the Ivy League school. At least this is how I kind of look at it. It's like, okay, well, 30 and beyond, it's how successful you've been in your business, right? Or, or what you're doing is for a job. Like how successful are you? Not necessarily where you went to school. And the only time I hear conversations, like, oh my God, he went to Penn, he went to Brown, he went to Yale, is followed up by, and he's unemployed. Like, or, or he's, it, it's just not a good, it's odd how that's, I, I've realized how that's changed over my life. It's like, oh, he's obviously really smart. He went to Penn. Mm -hmm. But as I get older, it's like, well, does that like kind of like thought of like that view from authority? Like, does that really, like that goes away as you get older. And for me, that's shocking that it's almost like it's that or nothing. Yeah. It's insane. Well, and, and doing what we do every single day, we know that that's the, that's the worst possible right. thing to look at. Like it just yeah. it makes no sense. But so Jeff Salingo wrote a book and is, and is a, a well-published in the college space and his book's called Who Gets In and Why. And in this interview style <clears throat> conversation of the article, it was on NPR uh, website. And the, the oops, sorry, the kind of reality is that the prestigious names have always had cultural cachet, mm -hmm. right? So they always have carried things. Um, but in this moment, it's almost that it's now like an, an Ivy or bust attitude. And the reality to that thinking, that the toxicity of that thinking is, it's well documented that you graduate in the top of your class from a major institution, mm -hmm. state school, whatever. There is virtually no earnings differential between that and an Ivy League education, mm -hmm. right? They're, 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 and, I, and I'll go on and I'll, fi I'll find the spot where it says it, but the, the value of higher education is almost being placed only at the top. Yeah. And unfortunately, if, you, if you're paying attention to what's going on right now, there are polarized, politicized environments in some of those elite schools. Mm -hmm. And it is ruining that kind of open forum that was higher education where you're supposed to go and your, your job is to learn how to learn, right. not learn how to be, you know, uh, stuck in the mud, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, so I, I, to me, that was a, that was a, a crazy component because one of the things we've preached for 20 years now is, you know, for a lot of families, if you go down what would be arguable, arguably a rung down mm -hmm. on the elite, elitism of the school, yeah. the money's still there, the mm -hmm. education's still there, and it can be well worth your while to make that decision, mm -hmm. right? And so this, this uh, I, I, I mean, it's almost a falsehood. It's like this, this it's head trash is what it is. It's, well, there's, there's not a guarantee you're gonna be successful in life if you go to Ivy Leagues. There's not a, a guarantee that you're not gonna be successful if you go to a, a state school or a lesser known private school i mean it's just there's that's just not true it's just not factual you know and it's well and they've been trying to measure they've been trying to measure the outcome mm -hmm. on college for a long time and the the one way unfortunately that people judge schools going in is not based on the return over a lifetime of mm -hmm. earnings on the outside what it is is the rankings in U.S. News and World Report, the rankings in yeah. Princeton Review and all these things. And so what are these rankings based on? 
right? So you're targeting a school that you consider elite because it's ranked in some magazine article right. for whatever reason, not because of the number one thing that you should be focused on, which is yeah. how much money can you possibly make or what quality of life can you live on the other side of college, yeah. right? If, you're, if your goal is to become a doctor, your goal is to become a lawyer, isn't really then the amount of students that move on to graduate schools and get scholarships at graduate schools really the factor that should matter in the decision-making process on that? You would think. Right, but it's not. Oh, no. Well, I mean, a lot of those rankings, it comes down to, well, how hard is it to get in? That is something that, you know, well, do they only accept 6% of their students? Another thing that they talk about is their yield. Well, if the school has to fill a 1,000 yep. seats, and they only have to accept 1,500 students to fill those, that, that means it's an elite institution, right? Because it's like every, almost everybody who's been accepted is going there. Well, these are some things that schools can manipulate, right? Yep. Like these are some, so how do you get your rankings to go up higher? Well, we'll, uh, we'll be very selective and know that not just the best students, but we're going to do some extra homework to see, well, if we accept you, what's the likelihood you're going to come? Yep. You get a higher percentage that, okay, now I can make us look like we are more elite than the other school that has to accept 2,000 students to fill that piece. But then the other thing, you, you, uh, well, because something that I always look at, um, and not as much the graduation rate, because it's based off of the six-year number. Wait until I get into that, because that is you, yeah. the statistics on graduation rates are insane right now. But one of the things that I look at that whenever I bring it up to parent, parents, they've never heard of it, is the retention rate. How mm -hmm. many freshmen come back sophomore year? Well, if you kind of have this stigma that you get into a private school and you're there for your first year and you know it might not be the best fit, you're talking about it's like that school or bust. Right, so when schools get these high rankings, when they get that elite status, what are the chances that the students are actually going to do what's best for them and go somewhere else? If you know, mentally, it's like, I got in here. If I leave, I'm a failure. Like I have to stay here. Is it that, or is it that it's that that it's that great of an institution? Yep. You know, so I I always like to look at that retention rate and kind of say, okay, well, how many kids come back? But the, some of the things you're talking about, that obviously would influence that number. So now, hey, because of how we've gotten this elite status with the rankings, now there's another piece of it that can, we know kids aren't gonna leave and now it makes us even look better. It's, uh, yeah, so colleges are run like a business, man. They are run like a business. <laughs> you know, and and if, yeah. you, if you can't get over that part, right, you're already losing in the mm -hmm. college game. If you don't understand, and, and you know, we talk about what we do for a living, helping families make sound choices on college and finance and, and how they come together to affect retirement, all that mm -hmm. stuff. Like, if you can't just understand that colleges are run like a business, you, you're gonna lose and make an emotional decision that has a significantly real mm -hmm. detrimental outcome, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a couple of the quotes that I think are awesome here, right? Uh, and this is this is Jeff Salingo again, and he's quoted, I'm often, I, I, as I often say, the job of Harvard is really to take a bunch of the smartest kids in the world every year and make sure they don't ruin the smart kids that they're already getting, hmm. right? So uh, start there. And then the next piece that I think is, is staggering, getting back to the difference in achievement of you know, the Ivy versus others, the, uh, the idea that elite schools don't actually make high achievers, but just sort of pick them out of the crowd has actually been studied uh, by mm. economists. And so the, there was one study done by Alan Kruger uh, and a few other folks years ago, and it talked about what happened to students who got into the elite schools and those uh, versus those that ended up going elsewhere, right? Same caliber of student, yeah. one going to elite school, one going to school down louder. And they, and they found that the, the outcomes were remarkably similar, yeah. right? So your uh, elite student, no matter where they go, right. is going to end up on a pathway to success, yeah. right? Not, not every time, not every right. person, but there is not this drastic difference, which I think whether it's uh, politics or media or whatever, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the noise that, you know, we started the show talking about the noise. It's the noise that forces people to you know, make this choice and try and get their student into an elite school that they may have no business being at that elite school and set the child up for failure to be disappointed in the fact that they didn't get into that school. And there's a, another article that I'll, I'll cross over to that talks about the idea that the admissions world is upside down right now. They don't know how to admit students. 
Mm -hmm. It is oh, yeah. it is crazy because you take away that SAT and ACT score mm -hmm. and you now have to dig into the curriculum at the school, the amount of APs, the 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 you know, to take an AP class is one thing. To get a 5 on an AP test is an entirely different thing. Yeah. So, can you get an A in an AP class and get a 2 or 3 on the test? Well, how does that pair up? Mm -hmm. So the admissions people have to now dig in further to try and make a decision. And guess what they don't have? The staff, the time, or the resources mm -hmm. to, to dig in like that. So you're arguably maybe, you're, you're a five-minute or seven-minute conversation in an admissions department if you get the conversation. Right. And then it's left subjectively to the individual that's making that call. Yeah. I, I, I've seen a, a, over the past couple of years, there have been... I want to say outliers, but it definitely changed on some students that were accepted at specific schools and students that were rejected. There was a big swing, mm -hmm. and it was it was very it was it was shocking because it was just it was so different from years past. Um, I think the other piece that kind of that sticks out to me as you're saying some of those things is also looking at well. Is everybody have the opportunity to take those AP courses? Yep. You know, and now are you limiting who you accept based on, you know, what if somebody doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, goes to a high school that has the same availability of courses as somebody else? It's not any fault of the student, but that might be a phenomenal student, and now they just don't look as good because there, you know, there's no SAT that, take, that takes into play. That kind of standardized. Okay, I can compare two students. Um, and got and now with those potential changes on the horizon, I think it's not it's not going to make things easier for an admissions department with some of the SAT changes that are that are going to be upcoming. Uh, I think it's only going to get tougher. So well, that's just, that's a good question, Dave. <laughs> if the college admissions department <laughs> doesn't is struggling and doesn't know what they're doing, how do kids get guidance? <laughs> how do gu how do guidance counselors try to navigate this if the people that they're, you know, they're trying to impress. They don't know what potential outcomes are. They don't know what the likelihood of being accepted is. It's, they don't know what they're looking for. How do you, how do you give the student the right, you know, the right advice at that point? It's, in, it's increasingly more difficult, which is why I think, again, what we bring to the table on the admission side mm -hmm. is it's the same thing we do on the financial side. Put yourself in the best possible situation mm -hmm. at the best strategic uh, position and the best school to try and maximize, right? Um, the And I'm, I'll find the uh, component where it talks about the, um, right here. All right, so uh, of more than 500 institutions that responded to the initial survey, nearly 80% voiced concern about their ability to, administratively, uh, to be administratively capable in the future while more than half, 56%, said they're concerned about their ability to adequately serve the students at the current staffing levels. This is on inbound admissions, right? Mm -hmm. So the enrollment data, basically National Association of, uh, Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, talks about staffing shortages, right? So you take away a very easy way to measure the quality of a student, mm -hmm. and then you short staff the departments that make these decisions and they don't have a key metric that they used to say yes or no based on mm -hmm. and they have to make the decision to accept these people right and then to teach them how to navigate the tuition payments and what are loans and how to go mm -hmm. through the whole thing so the 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 very downside of this is that it becomes increasingly difficult to now say well Here's the activities you need to show. Here's right. the essay you need to write. Here's the, how yeah. do you make up for the SAT score? And we've had interviews with schools, tons of them, yeah. where, you know, they've changed their algorithm. Yeah. They've put more weight in one area versus mm -hmm. another. Well, what if one school puts more weight on the essay and the other school puts more weight on the GPA? Right. And you don't know that yeah. going into it, right? And then it becomes more subjective of the person who's reviewing it, mm -hmm. which is a, a whole nother uh, crap shoot that you have to deal with, right? Well, with these staffing shortages and, you know, this issue, wouldn't colleges start to charge less? You would think. Or is it that more money's going into the marketing to make sure that... The last decade, 25% <laughs> increase in overall tuition. Yeah. In the last 10 years. Yeah. Last 20 years, nearly double. Yeah. Right? 
So, and, and why is that, why is that possible? And how can that, how can that continue to remain? Right? Well, when you look at the enrollment numbers at some of these different institutions, mm-hmm. there is an absolute onslaught of applicants, mm-hmm. right? And when you remove the SAT and the ACT, what happens? Well, now my GPA is a 4.4. Right. You probably I'm gonna think you have a better shot of getting in. Right? Yeah, so those elite schools we're talking about are the ones that are getting overloaded with applicants. Mm. And then the the question is, if they don't get in, where do they go? Where's the secondary component, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, and I think, I think we're in this, a lot of noise out there. Yeah. And one of the things that always has been kind of a guide to me is when you go into um, a courtroom, you don't represent yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Because only a fool represents himself, right? Well, there's a lot of noise out there about, about liability and uh, were you injured on the job and there's all kinds of noise, right? Mm-hmm. And you attach yourself to a lawyer to go there. When you're earning large incomes and you have you know assets and funds and your tax burden is gonna be big, who's the first person you turn to? Your accountant. Because there's a lot of <laughs> noise yeah. on what you should do, what you shouldn't do, what mm-hmm. you can do, what's legal, what's all of a sudden college becomes another area of extreme noise. Yeah. And what do people do? They try and fight this fight on their own. That's right. And that is, I mean, uh, to me, this is great for our industry. It's great for what we do, sure. right? But people have to be aware of it. Yeah. Right? In these articles that I've done and there's 12 of them on the sir 2467 nine on the screen right now Mm -hmm. of those nine articles there's contradictory information in each one yeah so you decide you're going to go into this on your own and you start doing the going down the rabbit hole one article says this the next article says that there's a silver lining there's no silver lining. the decline is here to stay the decline is just temporary it's transient what so what is the truth what is the reality well before we get to the, the next kind of segment, which is, is it worth the investment, right? The, the reality is that the landscape has changed and it hasn't changed slowly. Mm-hmm. It has been rapid yeah. and extraordinarily rapid. And, when, and since 2000, the rising cost of tuition, schools are double what they were in 2000, right? When you have that type of price inflation, the conversation changes. It's no longer just, um, hey, you know, college is the next step for you. College mm-hmm. is what you got to do because it becomes now a question of affordability. Yeah. And then add on top of it all the noise about student debt and student loans and how to do it. Well, my argument to everyone is the $1.7 trillion student debt problem is because people didn't hire the right people to help them out. Yeah. Right? There is no reason for that debt to exist the way it does. Yeah. But it's people making poor decisions financially and it's people making poor decisions on, on the institution they attend. I, also, I mean, without a doubt, it's going into a blind, right? It's ultimately not knowing how the system works, just thinking that it's you apply, you get in, here's the price and that's it. And then, oh, uh, you get the bill in the mail and you haven't prepared for how you're going to pay that bill. It's so many families, that's the route they've gone. And, and that's that's the re- that's exactly what you're saying, that they didn't know that there was people out there to actually give them help. I can't tell you how often people say, we didn't know people like you existed, Yep. right? And the next thing that always comes up after that is, I wish I met you five years ago, right? Because they know they've made the mistakes in the process and that they're, they're, they wish that they did it sooner. But that honestly is, is when you talk about, especially we've done episodes on the plus loan, it's it's because you've gone in blind. Yep. You know, and it's and it's the only it's the only string you can pull. Or it's that's <clears throat> the the chatter. Well, you see all the student loan debt. How do kids go to school? They borrow. Like the, if obviously that's the way people do it. Nobody can afford it, so that's just what we're going to do because that's what everyone else does. So, yeah, and the the. The loan crisis is a self-indulgent crisis. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a not taking the subject matter seriously. Mm-hmm. And I think thirty years ago, college tuition was was not mm-hmm. the the same 
financial commitment that it is today. Yeah. And so when that revolutionizes, so too does the thought behind going and how you go mm -hmm. and what you choose, right? Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, other, the other part that becomes um, tedious for people is you have, I mean, think about what we're coaching. We're coaching parents and their student to make a sound decision, both financially and academically, for their desired profession. So you've got to make a lot of really critical choices in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. at a very young age, with hopefully the guidance of the parents. Well, how many people are first generation college students? Mm -hmm. There's a lot out there. Well, if that's the case, what advice can the parents bring to the table? Right. Maybe they're good thinkers. Maybe they've done their research. But that, again, there's another crapshoot there. So um, to add to that, even parents that have gone to college, when they, you kind of teach them the system, yep. everybody goes, oh, my God, this is so different than how it was when I went. It's, it is. It, it is very different, mainly because of how the price has increased. So the, the one thing that I wanted to also kind of throw out there is like you'll hear the parent come in or the chatter in the parent world, which is like, I'm not paying, you know, $80,000 for a journalism degree right. or a creative writing or something yeah. like that. But the college tuition doesn't change. Mm -hmm. You pay what the price of the school is, regardless of what you're going to graduate with. Mm -hmm. You can graduate from with a $300,000 investment on a career path that will never return that investment. Yeah where you're a $50,000 person or you're an $80,000 job, right? So my question is, why isn't there a better system to determine the cost of the education commensurate with the outcome of the education, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, you wanna be a lawyer, a doctor, and have the potential to earn a million dollars a year, mm -hmm. charge $800 an hour, you're gonna pay for that. Yeah. But if you wanna be a social worker, that's going to earn a hundred, maybe mm -hmm. hundred and fifty, if they're at the top of their at, of their um, career. Yeah. Should you pay the same amount that you pay to become a a, a doctor or pre med or go through that? How now, can the can the college manage that? Now you tell some professor that their life's work is less valuable than the life's work of someone else. Mm -hmm. Now we get into the equity issues and we mm -hmm. get into all the diversity, equity, inclusion stuff that's going on, which mm -hmm. that's its own can of worms, right. right? So again, I think that's the fair way to do it, but I don't know that the data or statistics will ever be presented yeah. in a way that would make that decision possible, right? And would you just kill certain industries by doing that. Yeah. Be interesting. You know, because, it, I mean, even look at the alternative to college, right? You can go to a trade school. There, yeah. there are, are, you can come out of the trades right now and earn six figures. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, I, I tell it to everybody, this is my profession is to guide families through college. But it's also that idea that it, you have to go it doesn't exist. You don't have to go. There's certain career paths, but it's not for everybody. The worst thing you can do is start going to college, take out loans, and then not finish. So yeah. let's let's get into that. It, it, that's the that's the worst thing that can happen. At least, well, maybe you, maybe you go <laughs> that you mentioned. You you have a degree that doesn't get you a job. That could be pretty bad too. But you know, in most cases, it's that you don't finish. You don't have that degree, but you still got the loans that came along with you know a few years. Yeah, um, and. There are some crazy statistics on graduation rates that we'll get into. But so mm -hmm. then my next rabbit hole I dove into is college worth it. Right. Yeah. And basically every article has four reasons why it is and four reasons why it isn't. And so the the summary is bottom line, a lot of jobs require a yep. college degree, right? So there are plenty of jobs you can choose that don't, but college degree opens up doors to career paths that you yeah. may not otherwise get, right? College graduates tend to make more money, right? According to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the median income for high school graduate is 30,000, while those earning a bachelor's degree make around 52,000, mm -hmm. right? As long as you graduate debt-free, the college diploma can help you build wealth a lot quicker. Now the question is, what if you don't graduate debt-free? Mm. 
and what does it do to that, you know, you could build wealth quicker right. environment. Also, in it, with the college degree, there is upward mobility that is uh, kind of leaps and bounds upward mobility as opposed to standardized pay raises, right? right? So you can get promoted, you can go further, you can get companies to pay for extra mm -hmm. degrees and things like that, right? Um, they talk about the skills you learn inside and outside the classroom, the problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, organization structure, all that stuff. So there's, there's, there's obviously mm -hmm. skills you can pull out of it. Um, but one of the, the interesting points to me was, and, and I don't know, I mean, this article is recent. So this was, let me just see when this was written. This is July 8th, 2022. And this is a Ramsey article written by Ken Coleman and Ken Coleman's is a pretty well-known speaker, but, um, the, you get access to resources and opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So um, guidance counselors, career centers, job fairs, clubs, volunteers, things that you wouldn't get otherwise mm -hmm. to gain experience, you'll need to make yourself stand out in the job market. Uh, there's another article that also talks about people with college degrees that go into the workforce, higher percentage of, of them have uh, medical insurance and benefits mm -hmm. that you know some of those other companies want. Yeah. So there are certainly reasons. What I found interesting was the idea and the reasons they put forth for why it might not be worth it, right? Number one is, does the job you really want, that's a double-headed sphere, because right. do you know the job you want yeah. as you go in? And does the job you want require the degree on the other side, yeah. right? So again, the back to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York report, it says that 43% of college grads are working a job that doesn't need a degree. Okay. That is a staggering statistic. Wow. Now, I can't cite that. That is a, I, I, this is pulling from the article, so I'm, yeah. I'm trusting it as real because it cites a Federal Reserve Bank of New York report. Um, the unemployment rate of 25 to 34 year olds who didn't complete their college education is 78%, right? Which isn't too bad considering the employment, or sorry, the employment rate, not the unemployment rate, the, right, employment, the employment rate, rate is yeah. 78%. The same group that went to college is 86%. So they're arguing that's pretty close, um, you know. 8% uh, higher. 8% mm -hmm. higher for, you know, employment rate for someone with a college okay. degree. So I look at that as uh, a positive to the college side as opposed to the negative. They're trying to infer and, and say that there's not that much of a discrepancy mm -hmm. there, but I would rather err on the side of 86 than I would on the 78. Um, the, I think the point that is very valid that everyone needs to consider, and I think this is something that is cultural right now in the US, is that just because you get a college degree doesn't mean you're gonna land the high paying job or become one of the 1%. It doesn't work that mm -hmm. way, right? Uh, any degree will help you bring home a paycheck, but not all degrees are created equal, right? Mm -hmm. You can't assume that you're just going to get you know, a $250,000 job because of that. Now yeah. this takes me back to the the comment on Harvard, which is their job is to keep smart people. And, right, and basically, not ruin them. Not <laughs> ruin them, right, just keep them going. Yeah. The reality to me is your performance in college and your performance in the workplace will indicate that, right? Mm -hmm. But just because you have a degree doesn't mean you're a hard worker, diligent, and yeah. committed to it, right? You can you can hang out in, yep. in the middle very easily uh, and just do a role every single day and go, go about your business, right? Um, the regret component, I think, is another thing to look at, right? Okay. So they're talking about, the, this is a pay scale survey, and 66% of those who pursued education beyond high school regretted their degree type, institution, or major, mm -hmm. or taking a student loan. That's two thirds of people yeah. regretted the choice they made going into college. Yes. If there is not a better statistic to endorse what we do from right. a college admission standpoint, from a financial standpoint, like I, I don't know what it is, 66%, two thirds of the population that graduates college is, is in some way or another, regretting a decision they made along the way. Well, when we do, you know, speaking engagement, we do workshops. It's a it's typically a question we ask: How many people have a job right now that they studied in college, where that their major lines up with? Yep. And you see, not many hands go up, right? And a lot of it is not just because of whether they couldn't get a job in that specific field. 
But most often when you dive into that conversation, it's, I thought I wanted to do this. I entered the workforce. I realized it wasn't for me. Luckily, I have a degree where I could get hired somewhere else and do a, something else that I was actually enjoy doing. Yep. Mm. Might have been better to figure that out sooner, right? Yeah. Like, without, but, without yeah, question. I mean, just think about when, you know, yeah, you're right. It's, I would say it's, I would actually, I, I, that kind of surprised me that the number is that low, that, like that regret, you know, of, of saying, I wish I studied something different. Well, I mean, again, you got to look at, well, I guess, yeah, you got to yeah. look at, I mean, how many people actually go even beyond, correct, you know, for graduate school, your lawyers, or I doubt lawyers and doctors are regretting. Well, like, I, who knows? I got a business degree, an economics degree. Mm -hmm. Very happy. <laughs> right? Very, like, I understand business, I understand the economy. It, yeah. Like, uh, I can apply it to anything I want to apply mm -hmm. it to. People sometimes scoff at a business degree. Mm -hmm. I go, well, I don't know. It, it deals with money and sales and mm -hmm. marketing and the way the world works. Yeah. So we don't need to get into my college journey. <laughs> right? I, made, I made every mistake you can make. And I, I'm one of those people that I thought I was going to go down a certain career path and I didn't get good advice. I took everybody at their word. I didn't ask questions and yep. it led to disaster. It led to money. It led to more time in college. Um, but hey, all things being considered, I'm glad where I'm at today. Yeah, I love what I do. The last point on the on the downside, and I think this is a statistic that we talk about. We throw it out every time we do a presentation. Mm -hmm. we, we travel all over the the country and and give presentations on college and the planning associated and the admissions planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, people like. I don't think people take us seriously when we say the graduation rate, mm -hmm. like how many people, I don't, I don't think people believe us. I think they think it's a made up number. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why, but the National Center for Education Statistics found that only 63% of college students finish their degree within six years. Wow. 63% within six years. It's not the four-year statistic. They don't even, you can't even find that right, statistic that anymore. Yeah. But only 63% within uh, six years. That means 37% of the people don't graduate within six years or yeah. don't finish their degree. I know a couple of years ago that the, the, the line that stood out to me was only one in four students that started college this fall will have their bachelor's degree in four years. Only one in four. That's actually saying it's, it's even less than that. Yeah. You know, so that's, wow. That's, it's, it's crazy. And so. Well, and that's six, but that's six years. Yeah. Wow. So only, only 63% graduate in six years. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. So now the, the, the point that I'll make there is, okay, so you've done everything right as a family. You're, you're a good income earner. You're both college educated parents. You've planned, you've saved, you've seen whatever vehicles, however much you wanted to save and your child comes out of the pandemic, ill-prepared to go to school, which is another article that we'll discuss. Their SAT scores are down. They lost two years of their uh, education. Yep. They're not ready to go to college, and you plan for four really well. <laughs> so you go pay for four. Yep. They don't graduate in six. They don't graduate in seven, and they don't graduate at all, but you just dropped how much money? Yep. All right? And so the fact that it, it's that's not taken more seriously is is crazy to me yep um and you know every parent me included expects the four year four years right yep the reality is it's not mm -hmm. it's just not so again i think you add all this stuff together and it just validates more and more that people need to seek out professional advice in this arena because it is not simply admissions or launch or career-based it's all of that plus it's financial it's retirement it's everything and if you don't understand the nuance of the system and how it works right you're going to go down a bad pathway and it could cost you a substantial amount of money mm -hmm. um so let me dig in there's another part that i wanted to hit here Let's talk about the reasons. This is another article on is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Everybody says college graduates earn more yep. than non-graduates. Uh, the majority of jobs require college education. 
Um, so th this is this is pretty cool to think about, right? In past generations, a college education wasn't necessary to earn middle class income, according to a Georgetown University uh, Center on Education and the Workforce study. Two thirds of jobs required a high school diploma or less before 1980, mm -hmm. right? So that's no longer the case. Georgetown University predicts that 70% of all jobs will require some college education by 2027. Without higher education on your resume, it may be more difficult to find high paying jobs and competition for available opportunities will be fierce, right? So again, you know, you go back to, it, it's a different world than it was. Yeah. Different world than people's parents went into. It's, a, it's just a different world. Um, you know, the apprenticeships and the things like that and just being credentialed by experience no longer exists. You need the experience and the degree, yeah. right? Um, this is the one I want to talk about. So college graduates are more likely to have health insurance, which is, which is interesting because skyrocketing healthcare costs and having quality health insurance is essential for well-being. However, purchasing health insurance on your own can be prohibitively expensive. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, the benchmark premium for a single person policy purchased through a health insurance marketplace is $5,500 a year. So what does that have to do with college? What people don't realize is there's a significant correlation between college education and healthcare coverage. Okay. College graduates are far more likely than high school graduates to have employer provided coverage offsetting their healthcare costs. The college board found that 64% of workers with bachelor's degree and 70% of workers with advanced degrees had employer provided health coverage, while employer plans covered just 50% of high school graduates, right? Yeah. So that's, that is a very interesting statistic to me that, you know, you're 14% more likely to have health insurance if you get a college degree from mm -hmm. your employer. Right? Uh, so the, I, and I don't know if that gets into full-time, part-time. It could. Right, you know, and yeah. is that, hey, is that number, what's the likelihood of having a full-time job with a degree versus, you know, hey, is it the, the high school diploma can get you income, but it's not full-time. And then you start to think about other things where it's not just like a health benefit, but if you're part-time, do you get a 401k match? Do you get, you know, other pieces of your financial world that need to be addressed? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's interesting. And, and the, I'm going to go to the, the reasons they say it's not worth it. And this was a Forbes article uh, written June 2022. Uh, so again, recent article. Mm -hmm. I did Forbes. We got NPR. We've got all these recent articles from, from different arenas. But the, the number one reason they talk about college is not worth it. You'll likely graduate with student loan debt. Now, tell me. Is there anyone in the world that doesn't know about the student loan debt crisis? No, I think everybody. So it is aware. a very public topic. Yeah. And so you throw that up as the number one reason to not go. It's already been politicized. It's already been a polar mm -hmm. subject. It's already been exercised. The noise is loud. It's louder than any other noise yeah. out there. And you're going to graduate with debt. And so, well, I read that and my question to whoever wrote this would simply be, okay, is your advice for people to not buy a house because you'll have a mortgage? Right. Like, what? Well, no. Bingo. Like, what? That's my whole point. That's, that makes But we've, we've, we've said it's so bad, it's such a yeah. crisis, it's so bad, it's such a crisis that people are like, whoa, I'm not getting involved in that crisis, you know, and they, and they just, they, they peel off of it. So, uh, and, and here's some statistics on it, right? Um, the, according to the Institute for College Access and Success, 62% of 2019 graduates left school with student loan debt and the average of balance of 28,000. Okay. Right? And? So it's a car payment. Yeah, I, I mean, that's it, it, for your education. I look at that and believe it or not, I actually think that number is surprising. Agreed. I would thought it been a lot higher. Right, the well, not, not the debt number, not the 28,000, that's 62%. Yeah, because and if you're if you're not aware of the system, that student loan debt twenty seven thousand essentially is offered to every student. Yep. So that's a hundred percent of students. Not, and some schools staff, don't offer it, but it's it's a Stafford loan that's offered by the government. So to say that only sixty two percent of students have debt with an average of twenty eight thousand, well, then you're telling me that there's a lot of people that aren't even taking the money that the government offers at a low interest rate in the student's name. And guess what? 
if you're talking about since 20, <laughs> since 2019, interest rates are really low. If you're somebody that paid that extra money, think about what the market was like 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. Well, rather than give that $5,500, $6,500, $7,500 a year to the school, would that money have grown more than that $27,000 with a little bit of interest and you actually would have been more well, your net worth would have been higher should you have taken the government's loans? And now, I'm not going to get into the forgiveness piece, but hey, that, I, that, I look at that and I go, how in the world is that a... Yeah, but what they don't tell you in this, Joe, you know? is the reality that we know, Yeah, right? That is student loan debt, and students can only borrow a right. certain amount in their name. So that's not accounting for the the trillions of dollars that is education-based loans that are out there. Right. Right. And so if the student can't take more and the student yeah. doesn't take on more, who does? And how yeah. does that affect the parents, the retirement, all that? Because it's the parents, it's the co-signer, it's the other person that takes the burden of that debt. I, I would have, I have so many questions, one about that statistic. Right. Because again, when I look at that, for me, that's going... Okay, so what the average cost of school is what, mm -hmm. and a student graduates with, you know, less than thirty thousand in debt, but makes how much more a year? So isn't that a positive, like a reason, like that? It almost sounds like it's backwards. That should be a reason that you're kind of saying, well, hey, if you plan right and you manage your debt, and your student graduates with twenty seven thousand, that they have skin in the game. For God, families I work with, that's mission accomplished. Like you said, it's the car payment, you know? And now you got a good return on your investment. You're, you got health insurance, you got mm -hmm. the higher pay, you know? Like, I don't know, I, I just read that and I go, I don't, I, I get so confused with how they're trying to tout that as a negative. I, you know, just knowing how the system, that, at least that number, how they're quoting it, right? I'm sure that doesn't get into what parents borrowed. Nope. Right? So it's, you're just talking to students. Well, the only loan students can get that's on, if that's what that's telling I'm it's it's just not a good no it's not all right so so moving on Joe on the, on the same subject yeah. so we talked about the first of all the statistic they're using to validate that is is rubbish because it doesn't go into the rest of the There's the environment so many questions because 28,000 doesn't turn into 1.7 or 2 trillion right. dollar problem right, right? um and then they go on in this to talk about the student loan repayment plan. It could take you 10 to 30 years to pay it off if you're paying your minimum monthly payments, if you mm -hmm. feel the pressure to put other financial goals on, on hold, which that I think is a more staggering issue, right? We're, and, and I wanna bring market into this too, because right now you have all these graduates with all this debt graduating college going into a job market in a down market where mm -hmm. unemployment is low, right? And do you know what happens when people's portfolios, top level executives, middle managers, VPs, director level people, when their portfolio drops out and they're 58 years old or they're 62 years old, do you know what they do? They hold on to that job for as long as they can to try mm -hmm. and ride it back up. And so the moment that you have uh, middle to upper management staying in position, you have limited upward mobility on the company. That limited upward mobility creates a lack of entry level jobs, which creates a very difficult market for graduates right. to get into, right? So you put all that together and it, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation. Yeah. Um, the last point that I wanted to make, and this, this I, I like this the Forbes approach to the graduation thing better than I like the approach on the other one because I think the other one was trying to stay current. So there's yeah. some speculation to it. This one talks is, is completely retroactive. Okay. Because the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center found that 58% of students, just 58% of students who enrolled in college in 2012 earned a degree within six years. Right, so it's a lesser number and this is completed because the rest of the students are either were either still in college mm -hmm. during that report or dropped out. Right, so that's an even lesser number of people graduating within the six-year mark yeah. than the other report, and so, but this one is completed because it starts in a 2012. So your six-year mark would be 2018, which we have all the statistics from 2018. Yeah, right, confirmed at this point, point. and that's pre-pandemic. Yeah, talk about a little yeah you know, scary. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and, and they go on to talk about community college and the, and the expense and the different jobs. But well, I think the, the, the big thing that stuck out to me is that, you know, if you're 
going into a major that is going to earn you, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars uh, at its high, at its peak of its market, then you have to be you have to be careful about what you're willing to spend on that education Absolutely. and and the debt you would take to it, right? I think the other side is there are some higher paying jobs that don't require the four year degree that don't. And so, but you wouldn't know those jobs unless you started the research and you started to go through those conversations and have those tough Mm -hmm. conversations. Reality is our students aren't prepared to have that conversation when they're asked to have that conversation. And too many parents are uh, ignorant to the subject matter of college acceptance and the way it works. So I think there's a, there's, you know, it's coming from all sides and it's uh, it's it's a tough spot. Um, you know, obviously the the one the, I, I found this entrepreneurship thing to be interesting. At, at the end of this article in Forbes, they talk about if you have an idea for a business, an entrepreneur, um, you you could start that business. The average entrepreneur, be your own boss, set your salary. The average earnings for that person is forty three thousand. Which, if you go to the electrician, the plumber, the carpenter, the mechanic, coming out of a trade school, you're at 56, 55, 48, and 42, respectively. Mm-hmm. So, and then when you go to the, you know, the technical degrees uh, or the two-year degrees, you could talk about, you know, radiation therapist at 80,000, computer programmer at 80,000. So, your 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 target has to be set. But but who really knows they want to be a dental hygienist when they're 17 years old? Right. I think that's a tough thing to mm-hmm. to come to terms with. And so, I mean, and again, not, I don't know if it talks about this in any of these articles, but you can show some of these numbers and these average salaries. But I also think that that comes along with that um, is the ability to move up. You know, like if you're a registered nurse, or you're, is, is there the ability to double your salary like in 10 years is you know the ability to to be somewhere where you potentially get some promotions i i mean god i always knew that you know my mom always used to say my grandfather he worked at dupont for his entire life and he never got promoted because he didn't have his degree now this god this is years and years ago but is that kind of hold you back as well not that there's again College isn't for everybody, but I was curious if, there, if did you read anything on that? Was there any statistics on the ability to move up into a company or be considered for management positions, promotions with a degree versus without, or yep. with a degree versus a you know a two year program? I'm just, I was just curious if there, you read anything on that front because those would be some questions I would ask somebody that would do research like this. Yeah, and and I I think that's the research that's lacking. Yeah, that's the real piece that we don't have the information mm-hmm. on. And so if you can't, if you don't know that information and you can't guarantee that, and yeah. you, you, like you gotta make the decision with the information you have at your fingertips, right? Potentially at 17 years old. <laughs> yeah, right, at 17 years old with an underdeveloped brain. Yeah. So uh, I wanna kinda end it here, but I, I wanna talk about, <clears throat> there's a lot of questions we always get, like the, the college bubble's gotta burst. It's, it's not a bubble, right. right? It's a supply and demand situation mm-hmm. and people are still applying, they're still going, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> why have college costs gone up the way they've gone, right? So it's a, it's a demand. So the demand for the degrees has increased at the professional level. Jobs requiring a bachelor's degree for employment, that the services that schools offer and the staff requirements to administer those services have increased. So they've just inflated the college's operating budget, right? There's also been money pulled back from different schools, which have forced that that expense to be passed on to the mm-hmm. end user. So when you take away some of the funding, some of the public institutions that have gotten state and local government funding, and you remove that money, it has to be made up somewhere, right? Yeah. Because colleges are what? They're a business. They're businesses. Right? And so if it's run like a business, that, that, that gets passed down. So, you know, what's the solution? The solution is be strategic, be be thoughtful, take this very seriously, take it more seriously than you would most other expenses mm-hmm. in your life because it's going to have a lasting impact. And it's not just going to have a lasting impact on one generation. Right. It's a multi-generation impact. And that that hits you know home for me because when I'm successful in guiding a family and, and we get through the process and now their kids aren't graduating with debt. You know, when a mom looks at me and says, thank God that he doesn't have to pay this debt off for the next 20 years and not start a family, not get married, not buy a house, because that's what I had to do. 
the fact that we were able to work this out and figure out the best path and fund it and save it, and it didn't hurt our retirement in the process, you nip it in the bud, right? Because now when you think about that, it's the same, it, it, it just, it will snowball, right? You take students now that if they don't figure this out and they graduate with $50,000 in debt, and now they have a job coming out of college that is 50 grand a year. Well, how soon can they start having kids? How soon can they start their adult life, get married? But then if they're paying off the debt, what's the reality they're gonna be able to save for their own kid's college, Yep. right? And 18 years later, 20 years later, what's the cost of college gonna be? What is that generation gonna be graduate? You can nip it in the bud and now you can say, hey, we can do this for our child so that our grandkids, we can get this ball rolling in the right direction. And that, when, when those conversations happen, when I see that happen, it's, Talk about gratification. Well, yeah, and, that, and, and that's just it. I, t I talk about my whole story of getting in the financial services industry and just not wanting to be there. It's shark infested waters. Everybody's trying to rip everybody else off. Mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, dog eat dog world. And you were never having a major impact. Mm -hmm. Like this is major impact stuff. Yeah. You're helping the, the parents slip into retirement. You're helping the student launch the right way. And you're helping the generation after that, right? Um, and I'll, I'll leave the last thought here. One point that I completely agree with in uh, this Forbes article is choosing the major is one of the biggest decisions you'll make as a student. Mm -hmm. And if you're not focusing on that and you're not exercising that and thinking about that and exploring what jobs are like and what that stuff is, you're missing the boat on this thing. So, yeah, great conversation. This was fun. Today. A lot of meat in there. Um, but pay attention to it. The noise is out there. Uh, you know, find someone who knows what they're talking about. Uh, before you before you go down this pathway because it can be very expensive uh, and ultimately it can it can set a lot of things off track the, the last piece I want to add to just what you just said though is when you find somebody that can help you with this you're hearing things like finding the major and avoiding student loans and the high cost those two worlds have to mesh yep. you can't whether it's you hire two different professionals to help you out with each of those individuals. You, you work with somebody like us that accomplishes both of those pieces. Yep. You can't focus on one without the other. It You will you will fail in this game if you only focus on one. 100%. Yeah. All right, guys, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week.